Okay, cool, this works. Uh, welcome everybody uh, to this morning session, which is uh, on a very important topic, uh, bridges. Um, we've seen recent hacks, so there's definitely work to be done in uh, you know, both theory and translating theory into application. Um, my name is Joachim. I'm a PhD student here at Stanford. I work on consensus protocols, uh, specifically proof of stake Ethereum security. And uh, I'll be uh, the session chair for this session. And um, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker of the session, Patrick McCory, who is with Infura. And he'll be talking about validating bridges as a scaling solution for cryptocurrencies. Hi, everyone. Oh, I do have the Wi Fi. Cool. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So, today I'm going to talk about validating bridges, which is basically roll ops. Who's heard of roll ops before? Cool. Who understands how they work? Okay, that's like half, uh, like, like, I know, like, sort of, sort of exactly. So, the motivation for this paper was sort of last summer. I sort of got, an, like, I was just sitting at home. I got the sort of COVID draw on lockdown. And I was getting really annoyed that no one had wrote this paper yet. So just to really explain in basic terms what roll-ups are trying to achieve and what they're trying to build. So that's sort of the motivation for this talk. And so without further ado, let's just get started. So as you can imagine, under the hood of a roll-up is just a bridge. And what we've really been doing for the past 10 years is bridge engineering. So it's building bridges that hold assets. So the classic example is Coinbase. You know, I lock my funds into their bridge, it gets unlocked in their service, I can transact as much as I want, then eventually I withdraw my funds and I take it out of Coinbase. And you can imagine, you know, the Coinbase bridge has some functionality. It could have a deposit function, a withdrawal function, and an allowance function. When I want to withdraw my funds, you know, I'll ping Coinbase to say, Coinbase, let me withdraw my 1,000 ETH because I'm a wonderful wheel. You know, and then Coinbase will send to the contract to say contract, allow Alice to withdraw her 1,000 ETH. Now, from the perspective of the bridge, because that's the most important thing, that's the biggest takeaway, we're always considering it from the perspective of the bridge. The bridge has to, you know, be convinced that Alice is entitled to this 1,000 ETH. You know, the bridge has all the assets, the bridge has to protect these assets. And in this case, the bridge is just trusting Coinbase. If Coinbase has authorized a 1,000 ETH withdrawal, then that's pretty much saying that this off-chain database is safe, is well, is alive, and Alice is entitled to these funds. So then Alice can come along, withdraw the funds out of the bridge, and obviously escape. But generically, what's happening here? You know, what's sort of the interaction that's happening? Generically speaking, we have this bridge contract that holds all of the assets. And this could be billions of dollars. And then we have this off-chain database with the account balances, the program state, and the off-chain database is really just describing the liabilities. And you know, what, from the bridge's perspective, the bridge wants to be convinced that the, you know, its assets will cover its liabilities on this off-chain database. And the trust assumptions really, you know, how is the bridge convinced that the database is okay and it can cover these liabilities? And over the years, this trust assumption has evolved. So obviously 10 years ago, the easiest way to build a bridge was with a single authority, you know, the one ring to rule them all if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. You know, there's the Coinbase and the bit stamps. Then we sort of uh, started moving on towards these multi-authority bridges. So as long as K out of N validators agree, then you can withdraw your funds from the system. So there's like the RSK, the liquid, and in fact, many bridges now that exist on Ethereum, so I need to update those logos. And then further on, we moved on to these crypto-economic bridges. And sort of, and this, like, Polygon's a great example of this with their proof-of-stake bridge. The real difference between these crypto-economic bridges and the multi-authority bridge is really, you know, sort of skin in the game. And the multi-authority bridge, they're all pre-installed, you know, they're sort of appointed in advance. For a crypto-economic bridge, I have to put my skin in the game, you know, I put down my funds, and I declare I'm gonna protect the system because if I don't, I'll lose my stake. But even with these crypto-economic bridges, they're basically just multi-authority. So back in 2021, around six entities controlled 85% of the stake on, on Polygon, 
If they all collude, they can steal the funds. But at the same time, if they all work together, they can protect the funds in the bridge. But what's really annoying is that in all of these systems, we're trusting less than 10 parties to protect our funds. And this sucks, right? You know, the whole point of Bitcoin was, you know, to uh, remove these trusted intermediaries that make the system work. And now we've just reintroduced these intermediaries when we want to do some fun interaction. And it sucks. And it doesn't just suck from an ideological perspective. It sucks from a practical perspective because they keep getting hacked. You know, Mt. Gox lost 850,000 Bitcoin that represents 6% of all Bitcoin that will ever exist. Bitfinex lost 120,000 Bitcoin, although if anyone's aware, Bitfinex did get back 97,000 Bitcoin by the Instagram wrapper. Don't know if anyone followed that wonderful tale. But, um, but the main point to take away here is, you know, these services don't want to get hacked. They want to provide a useful service to their customers. But the issue is that they have to take a set of human processes to protect a single signing key. And the issue is that humans don't scale. So every time I create a new service, I take these human processes and try to reapply it here. And that's just difficult to do, so they lose their funds. And Taylor has this wonderful spreadsheet I can share afterwards. She's kept track of all the hacks for the past uh, eight, seven years. So it's a great document to you know, reinforce this point. But what about these multi-authority bridges? You know, surely, you know, what's nice about a multi-authority bridge is that it makes it a bit harder. Instead of compromising one entity, you may have to compromise five validators out of nine. But again, that's not impossible. And the run on bridge was a great example. They lost $500 million for the crypto. But actually, you know, it's four of these validators were actually just one company. And then this one company had pseudo mode over the other validator. So really only one entity was hacked. So it wasn't really a multi-authority bridge, but it's a great example of uh, security by uh, obfuscation. But the main point here is that we've sort of forgot about this motto, you know, not your keys, not your coins. It's sort of a Bitcoin maxi motto. But we forgot about it when we're building these third-party services or these off-chain services. So the question is, you know, can we transact on an off-chain system like Coinbase without or while maintaining self-custody of our funds? So I can lock my funds into the service, and then I can transact on the service. But I never have to trust the off-chain system to protect my funds. That's sort of the goal for these bridges, you know, the ultimate goal. And this goal started back in 2014 with the original sidechain paper. They call it a two-way peg. They don't use the word bridge. But actually what they're trying to build is this trustless bridge. And the idea is very straightforward. I take my Bitcoin. I lock it up on the Bitcoin network. I then unlock it on an experimental blockchain. I transact here as much as I want. And eventually, I can move my funds back to Bitcoin. And that was the goal of the original sidechain paper. Of course, you know, Bitcoin couldn't support it, so it can never be built. Uh, that's a dilemma. But anyway, that was the goal. And it's a brilliant goal. You know, it's a very, very exciting goal that we wanted to achieve. Uh, today, if you're going to reclassify this, I would call it the consensus bridge. The idea is that there's this other experimental blockchain with its own consensus protocol. Then on the bridge that may sit on Ethereum, the bridge is just really checking you know, the, any decision made by that consensus protocol. So the classic example is like proof of work. You know, maybe, on the, or maybe on the Bitcoin, there's a new block. You take that block header with the proof of work. You send it to the bridge on Ethereum. Ethereum will check the proof of work and say, yep, it's a valid block, and then process it. But the issue here is that if you're relying on an external consensus protocol to protect the funds in the bridge, then actually you're still trusting a set of parties. So the classic example here is that in proof of work, a miner could produce an invalid block for Bitcoin, but then take that block header and just send it to the bridge on Ethereum. The bridge doesn't check the integrity of the block, it just checks if the proof of work was valid. So you have two issues, you know, it's still trusted. If the consensus protocol goes offline for whatever reason, your funds get stuck on this experimental system. And that sucks. And obviously, if you don't have fancy zero knowledge proofs, then there's also the integrity issue as well. You know, an invalid transaction could be processed by the bridge. And this is sort of how the rainbow bridge works between Near and Ethereum today. 
So again, the question, you know, can we really build a bridge that protects us from an all-powerful adversary? So even if the entire system goes offline, I can still get my funds out. And this all began with plasma. You know, on hindsight, this all began with plasma. On plasma was this, uh, this idea of building a bridge that can validate independently that everything's okay. Now, in classic, I actually said this to Joseph yesterday as a joke, you know, in classic Poon style, the paper is very, you know, very interesting to read. It's a great paper, paper great insight, so it's very difficult to read. Um, you know. But over the next two years after they proposed this idea called plasma, we had two years of people in the community proposing different variants of plasma, trying to find one design that will work and obviously see if the dam build the best bridge. But plasma never achieved this goal. You know, plasma was just way too complicated of a design space. And thanks to a wonderful guy called Barry Whitehat, who was around the past two days as well, if you can catch him, he's ginger, he's Irish, wonderful guy. He actually simplified the entire design space. He basically said, well, let's take the data and just post it to Ethereum so we don't care about the data availability problem anymore. We just care about state transition integrity, which we'll explain later on. So he posted this repo, simplified the entire space, and it was called a roll-up. And that's where roll-ups come from. You know, that's sort of initiated the next wave of solutions that were built. And I would call this a validating bridge. Because the idea is that you have this executor, for example, you know, they're going to update the database with my wonderful 1990 animation. They'll then take their uh, proposed update and they'll send this to the bridge. And they'll say, bridge, this is the new state of the database. Now the bridge will you know, step back a bit and say, well, executor, I'm not going to trust you. I'm not going to blindly trust your signature. You have to somehow convince me that this proposed update to the database is valid and correct. And so then the executor will have to send some convincing evidence to the bridge and say, yep, here's you know, convincing evidence that it actually is a valid update. You know, the, the bridge will check this, you know, is it safe, is it alive, and then it will accept it. So it's validating everything about the off-chain system. And this is basically what the rule-ups are trying to build. They're all trying to build this validating bridge under the hood. And hopefully, if one team can get it right, then ultimately, the bridge is protecting you, the smart contract is protecting you, and a system like Ethereum is protecting your funds. So it's a bit like a box, you know, sort of punching the adversary and not letting the adversary to win. Well, this sounds really cool. But it also sounds a bit too good to be true. So how do they work? So we're briefly going to go over, you know, here are the agents, a high-level overview of how validating bridge may work, and of course, the threat model and the security properties. You know, what does it mean to be secure in this context? So the agents are very straightforward. We have Alice. She's an honest user. She wants to interact with her mooncats. You know, she just wants to interact and send transactions. We have the sequencer. The sequencer's role is to take all the transactions, order them for execution, and then pass them on. Then the executor will take the ordered transactions, execute them, and propose an update to the database. So let's have a high level view of how this works. And of course, all rule ups are different in terms of implementation, but this is just a high level. So Alice comes along, and Alice will deposit one coin into the bridge. Then eventually, this will pop up on the off chain database. Then Bob comes along, you know, hi, Bob. And Alice wants to send one coin to Bob. So Alice will sign a transaction, give it to the sequencer, and that's it. Then the sequencer could notify Bob to say, Bob, you're going to receive one coin. But the transaction's not yet final. It's not even publicly known. You know, it's just pending. The sequencer will wait around for a while, you know, collect all the off-chain transactions. And eventually, the sequencer will order the transactions for execution and submit it to the bridge. And the bridge, We'll have this list of transactions, and it will decide, you know, this is the order they should be executed. Then later on, you know, they're ordered, but they're not yet executed. An executor comes along, you know, pick up the transactions from the bridge, execute them, and then propose an update to the bridge to say, bridge, given those transactions, this is what the database should look like. 
And obviously, the convincing evidence is sent as well. And this just happens continuously. You know, we order transactions, we execute transactions, we order transactions, and the bridge is always checking that it's valid. And of course, any, any, uh, sorry, any honest user should be able to come along, take the data from the bridge, recompute the database independently, and then of course check that the database is correct. I may use that for other purposes. So that's how it works at a high level. So what's the adversarial threat model? You know, who are we trying to fight against? Or who's trying to break the system, should I say? So there's two ways to think about it. One is Massey's flow control. The only guarantee we have is that Alice can send a transaction to the bridge in the layer one. Any Massey sent on the layer two system could be viewed, reordered, or dropped by the adversary. The adversary can control the entire off-chain system and guarantee no message is delivered. And two, we assume the adversary can corrupt nearly every single party. The only person who can't be corrupted is one honest party, which could be the, you know, the Mooncat user, and of course the bridge on Ethereum. All sequencers and nearly every single executor could be corrupted. And this is really the most powerful adversary you can describe. And in practice, Many of the roll-ups cannot defeat or constrain this beast. It's a very, very difficult adversary. So what does it mean to be secure in this context? You know, what are the security properties? What are the goal? So the ultimate goal is to protect the safety and the liveness of this off-chain database. And there's three sub-goals to this. One, remember, this is all from the perspective of the bridge. The bridge needs to be convinced that all the data is publicly available, so anyone can compute a copy of the database. Two, the bridge needs to be convinced that every transaction processed by this database is valid and correct. And three, the bridge needs to be able to enforce such that if the entire system eventually goes offline, one honest party can eventually get their, transact you know, their transactions executed by the system. Now, the important bit is, the bridge has the sole discretion over this entire system. There's no honest majority. There's not even a peer-to-peer -peer network. Quote, it's just from the bridge. So what about the data availability problem? You know, uh, how does that work? Or what's the problem there? So there's three questions. You know, why does the data need to be publicly available? What data needs to be publicly available? And how do we guarantee it's publicly available? So, why does it need to be publicly available? Well, it's because we need one honest party to assist the bridge. They must have a copy of the database in order to execute transactions and propose an update. If only the adversary has a copy of the latest database, then no one can propose an update to the database. Very straightforward. What type of data can be posted? So there's two types of data. Typically, in the optimistic rollups, they'll send a list of transactions to the bridge. So everyone can see every transaction is executed. With the validity rollups, what's quite quirky is that they don't have to send the transaction data. They'll send the validity proof alongside a state diff, and basically a state diff says this is how you update your database. You know, you replace these storage values. And so in a validity rollup, you don't have to reveal the transactions at all. So it's their side effects or their impact on the database, and that's really exciting. And how do we guarantee it's available? Plasma tried to do an on-chain challenge, and obviously that failed. Some uh, teams are now relying on data availability committees where you have 10 parties, you assume one is honest, and they'll all sign off that the data is available. And of course, rollups, they just take the data and they send it directly to the bridge. And that's how we guarantee it's available because it was posted to Ethereum at one point in time. So what about this transition integrity problem? How do we solve that? Well. The problem is that if the adversary could include one invalid transaction and get it processed, they can steal all the funds in the system. So that's the problem we're trying to solve. And the way we solve it is, you know, bingo, sort of the optimistic versus the ZK, the fraud proofs versus the validity proofs. You know, this is actually the one topic that everyone talks about, but there's only one problem in the space. And so I won't go into detail here because obviously there's not much time. But that's what, you know, when you hear fraud proofs or validity proofs, they're trying to solve this one problem. And of course, what's really exciting is that, you know, if I send a proof to Ethereum, the proof does, like, or even just the fraud proofs, all these off-chain rollups, you know, like the Arbitrums, Optimisms, ZK Syncs, all of these quirky virtual machines, 
that are, you know, that may or may not be compatible with Ethereum, like Cairo. Cairo has absolutely nothing to do with the EVM, yet Ethereum can check that it's valid. So now we can build these cool experimental blockchains and prove that they're valid to Ethereum. What about censorship resistance? So I won't go into the detail here, but you know, the problem is very straightforward. Alice will ask the sequencer, sequencer, can you process my transaction? And the sequencer says no. You have to deal with customer support before you get your funds out. So what I do want to highlight is that the sequencer has absolutely nothing to do with censorship resistance whatsoever. The sequencer could be fully centralized, and you can still have a censorship resistant system. You just have to assume there's one honest executor out there who will pick up the honest user's transaction. So there's one honest party assumption there. And there's two approaches for it. So in the V1 rule-ups, they had this on-chain exodus. So if a transaction was censored, the database would be frozen, and then everyone could withdraw their funds. In the V2 rule-ups, they focus on forced inclusion. What I mean by that is any user can send a transaction to the bridge, and the guarantee is that the system can never freeze or go offline. It must always eventually make progress. But there's a lot of nitty gritty details here that aren't well explored. So if you're interested in writing a paper or doing research, this is the first thing I would tell people to go look at. There's risk conditions, delay attacks, overhead of constraints. Any paper that even tried to summarize this would find so many jewels of why it's a non-trivial problem. But if you can solve all three problems, then hopefully you can slay the beast and deploy a secure layer two system. And also for the OGs, this is the bear wheel from 2014. So this is the old bear market. And obviously we're slaying the bear wheel. Uh, but other problems emerge, and obviously I don't have a lot of time for this talk, but I'll summarize them. You know, one is, you know, what happens when you have you know, 100 different rule-ups? The assets get fragmented between the rule-ups, so if I'm an Arbitrum, how can I quickly get my funds the optimism? Or in fact, another cool idea is, what if I'm an Arbitrum? You know, maybe I want to go to optimism, take a loan on Aviv, or Ave, take a loan on Ave, maybe go to you know, Starknet, perform a swap, and then bring the funds back to the Arbitrum. You know, how could we gracefully handle failures when there's smart contract interaction along the route? It's very much a lightning network problem with his TLCs, et cetera. But it's a very fun problem that many, not many people have really solved. Uh, another is the return of the data availability challenge. You know, could, the biggest cost for rollups today is data. You know, could we optimistically keep the data off chain, but obviously post it to Ethereum in the worst case? The problem there is the fisherman's problem, which we can talk about afterwards, but I think it's very solvable today. What's really cool is these experimental virtual machines. You know, we have Cairo, we have these EVM equivalent virtual machines, compatible EVM, or even EVM native now. And it's just really cool to see that you can build these experimental virtual machines in layer two, experiment with new features, but still get security from Ethereum. I've already spoke about censorship resistance being non-trivial. MEV is obviously a big problem. The sequencer is the only party with the list of pending transactions. They hold on to these tra transactions for 10 minutes, one hour. You know, they can extract as much MEV as they want. And finally, just this formal model. You know, how do we evaluate the ideal bridge? So in the end, is it worth it? You know, should we care about the rule-ups? So I'm nearly just one, 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 one minute. Be awesome, awesome. So it's worth it because we're now moving to the world of Web3. When you consider the Web2 world that we've had for the past 10 years, you lock your funds in Coinbase, and you give away full custody of your funds to Coinbase. Today, if you lock your funds in Arbitrum, you lock them in, but you still maintain custody. But you still get this wonderful Web2 experience of sort of you know, instant finality, or at least it feels that way when you interact with it, thanks to the sequencer. And so I hope in the next five years, when we see these rule-ups emerge, it will feel like you're interacting with Coinbase or Binance, but actually behind the hood, there's a centralized sequencer, but a decentralized backend that's guaranteeing that your funds are safe. And so the reason why this is going to be useful is because custody is going to be a liability for a lot of companies. So my final slide, you know, as we saw over the past 10 years, it's difficult, it's difficult to build a centralized service to hold cryptocurrencies. You know, Coinbase has $100 billion worth of crypto today under custody. It's very difficult to compete with Coinbase because I have to take a set of human processes and try to protect $100 billion. And I definitely do not want that liability in my life. 
you know, we've, you know, they keep getting hacked. So if one rollup team can get it right, if they can build a validating bridge that actually works, then what's really exciting is that any operator could take that code, a bit like Linux, you know, you take the code, reinstantiate it, and offer your service out to your users without taking custody of your, you know, off the funds. So I don't think users care about this at all. You know, users just want to play with their mooncats. Operators care. Operators can offer the same services Coinbase without having to protect $100 billion. And that's why I think this will take off. So thank you very much, guys. Cool. Any questions? Thanks, Patrick. Uh, can we have the mic? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Patrick. You're testing my uh, session chair. <laughs> I know. I saw um, yeah, I saw you come up, and I was like, line up at the mic. Uh, there's already one question. Go ahead. Uh. Doesn't work. Oh, here we go. Um, thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask you by like kind of targeting these validating bridges, you kind of like do away with uh, L1 to L1 bridging that are traditional, what we call bridges. Mm -hmm. So like if you kind of roll this forward, do you kind of expect a future where all, uh, there's one giant winner of blockchain, say Ethereum, and then the other L1 chains become sort of L2 chains on top of that one so that everything can be validated. If I kind of roll this forward, that's kind of what I'd imagine. I just want to get your thoughts on it. Um, so I don't want to say that L2s will replace L1s that exist today, like Ava, for example. I don't think Ava's going to go away because of the L2 world. I think that if, you're, if you want to build like a centralized looking service, you want to build an L2 because you'll get this nice instant finality. But if you want to build an L1 network, then sure, you'll just deploy an L1 network. I mean, it just comes down to trust assumptions. Do you want to trust the, like an honest majority in a new network? Or do you want to have shared security from a network like Ethereum or another layer one? So I don't think, I, I think those are both red and, you know, next to each other. But I think one thing I do want to highlight is that the bridge between L1 and L1, I don't typically like calling those bridges. I just call them a synchrony solution. You know, you have these like man in the middle who synchronizes an update between two databases. So it's like an interoperability solution, which is also quite nice. So I hope that answered it. Cool. Thanks, Patrick, for the fantastic talk. So one, one aspect I was uh, missing, maybe, was uh, the privacy aspect. So if mm -hmm. I understood correctly, it seems like, for example, the, what you call the executor would see pretty much who pays to whom, how much, what time. So is there any work or any thoughts on privacy and what's your, your thoughts about that? Um, so right now, obviously, all of, all, so all of the rule apps have zero privacy in them. So even like for the validity systems, like Starkware, you know, they, they use zero knowledge, well, they don't actually use zero knowledge proofs, but they use, you know, for the integrity, not for the privacy. But because you can build, you know, arbitrary experimental virtual machines, and all Ethereum's eventually going to get is a proof, then actually your virtual machine here could also be private. There's no reason why you can't deploy a private contract in these systems. And then you, you know, you get some privacy from the operator. There's also some of these protocols, like the fair ordering protocols, where you could do a commit and reveal there as well, or, you know, threshold decryption, so they aren't aware of your transaction before, before it's ordered. So yeah, you can definitely build a privacy system on this. Okay, thanks. Cool. We have time for one more question. Oh. Hi. Yeah, so here we're referring bridges as custody solutions, and then you're talking about layer two as those type of rollout bridges. So how would you categorize layer three, layer four, if they ever comes? Will those be like bridges of bridges? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. So I think what you'll, like, this is sort of the StarkNet dream, isn't it? So you'll have this, you'll have the Ethereum network, you'll have a bridge that's StarkNet, and you have these op chains. And so what'll happen is that you'll lock your funds in the one op chain, and then, you know, what you could do in this network is move your funds by the bridge, I mean, the, the layer three bridge in this sense, from op chain to op chain. But all that would be composable, and basically, from the user perspective, all that gets aggregated into a single update. So the user will just say, move it to this op chain, then within the next epoch or the next update, it'll be moved across. So I think from the user perspective, they won't be aware of the bridges for the op chains, but there will be, there should be a bridge contract there. So you'll see like layers, like hierarchy of bridges in a sense. Got it, thank you. Cool. Cool, let's thank Patrick one more time. Awesome.
Okay, cool. Uh, our second speaker today is Yijie Shui from Brown University, and she'll be talking about transferable cross-chain option. Hi, good morning. My name is Yijie Shui. I'm a final year PhD student at Brown University. I'm graduating next year, so I'm currently I'm looking for new opportunities. I'm glad to be here to present our work, Transferable Cross-Chain Options. This is joint work with Daniel Engel and Maurice Hurley. First, what is a cross-chain option? Some of the audience may be familiar with options in financial markets. In finance, options are financial derivatives that give buyers the right, but not the obligation, to buy or sell an asset at a great upon price and date. The cross-chain option we talk about here is nearly the same, but in the context of blockchains. Now let's first look at what a cross-chain option is in our context. The story of cross-chain options starts with atomic swaps. An atomic swap is an exchange of cryptocurrencies across different blockchains. For example, here, Alice wants to trade one Bitcoin with 10 Ethers from Bob. This can also be viewed as Alice wants to buy 10 Ethers from Bob with one Bitcoin. Atomic swap protocols usually use a special kind of smart contracts called hashed time lock contracts, HTLC for short. HTLC enables conditional asset transfer through a lock. The lock consists of a hash value H and an expiration time T. The contract transfers the asset if the intended receiver provides a pre-image H before T. Otherwise, refund is triggered. Now let's look at the atomic swap protocol for Alice to buy ethers from Bob. We'll see the option in the protocol. First, Alice escrows one Bitcoin into HTLC on the Bitcoin blockchain. The hash value for the lock is H generated by Alice, so she knows the pre-image S to H. Then, Bob escrows 10 ethers on the Ethereum blockchain with the same hash value H. After seeing Bob's escrow, Alice sends the pre-image S to Bob's contract, and then she gets 10 ethers. Now, Bob learns the pre-image of H. He sends it to Alice's contract, and then he gets one Bitcoin. We can see that in step three, Alice has an option. She can choose to release the secret S to buy Bob's 10 ethers, or she can choose not to release the secret, then the trade aborts. This is similar to options in finance, where Alice has a right to buy 10, sorry, Alice has a right to buy 10 ethers from Bob with one Bitcoin, but no obligation. In this example, Alice is called an option holder, and Bob is called an option provider. Like in financial markets, options should be transferable. That means one should be able to sell it to someone or buy it from someone. There are some related work on cross-chain options. However, they only enable establishing an option. Once established, the options are not transferable. That means in our example, their work don't allow Alice to sell her option. In our work, we propose protocols to transfer options in a safe, non-blocking, and best effort manner. By safe, I mean no one will lose their asset without getting others' asset. By non-blocking, I mean if Alice wants to sell her option, Bob cannot block it. By best effort, I mean if Alice wants to sell her option, she can try many times until she finds an honest buyer to complete the transfer. We provide three protocols to transfer options. To put more precisely, to transfer their positions in the options. We have protocol A to C, which allows the option holder 
Alice, in this example, to sell her position to Carol. We also provide protocol B2D, which allows the option provider, Bob, in our example, to sell his position to David. We also provide protocol Q for them to sell their positions with best effort. There are a few challenges in design protocols for option transfer. The first challenge is safety for Bob. Suppose Alice holds an option to trade her A coin with Bob's B coin, and the hash value for the lock is HA generated by Alice. And now Alice transfers her position to Carol on the A coin contract, and the hash value is replaced by HC generated by Carol. But in Bitcoin contract, the hash value doesn't change. Then safety is compromised. So now Alice can collect Bitcoin when she releases the pre-image of HA, but Bob cannot collect, Bob cannot collect A coin. So Bob should be able to object if Alice or Carol cheats. Another challenge is that the transfer should be non-blocking. Suppose Alice honestly transfers her option to Carol, but Bob always objects, then no transfer can happen. So Bob should not be able to object or block the transfer if Alice and Carol are honest. Now it's time to look at our approaches. The big picture is we provide atomic option transfer protocols for Alice to transfer her position to Carol and for Bob to transfer his position to David. Protocol A to C and protocol B to D can be executed independently and simultaneously. In this talk, I will focus on introducing protocol A to C, which allows Alice to transfer her option to Carol. Protocol B2D does a different job, and the protocol is different, but technically there are not much difference. So we'll just focus on introducing protocol A to C. The protocol is really complicated, so here I will just focus on introducing the ideas underlying the protocol rather than precise details. Before protocol A to C is executed, Alice holds an option provided by Bob. After protocol A to C is successfully completed, Carol will hold the option provided by Bob, and the hash value will be replaced by some hash value generated by Carol. The states of those contracts are shown on the top. For example, in a coin contract, the hash value for the lock is HA generated by Alice. The recipient is Bob, meaning Bob will get the asset if he provides a pre-image of the pre-image of HA. The owner is Alice, meaning Alice will get the asset when refund is triggered. We need to change those fields from the top to the bottom. To transfer Alice's row to Carol, protocol A to C consists of four phases. In the muted lock phase, Alice mutates the lock request to transfer her role to Carol. Because Alice may only mutate the lock in one contract, or she may mutate the lock differently in two contracts, there is a consistency or contest phase for Bob to keep the mutation on two contracts consistent or just revert the mutation. Bob broadcasts Alice's mutation request to both contracts to keep them consistent. In the replace or revert phase, Carol commits to replace Alice or she aborts. Because Carol may only commit in on contract, the, sorry, because Carol may only commit in one contract, so there is another consistency phase for Bob to broadcast Carol's commitment to both contracts to keep them consistent. Now let's take a closer look at what is happening in each phase. In multi lock phase, Alice requests to transfer her role to Carol by sending a mutation transaction. 
in the mutation transaction, she sets the new owner or recipient to Carol and sets a new lock to HC generated by Carol. And in, additionally, she sets a commit lock for Carol to commit the replacement is HC prime. Then in the consistency or contest phase, Bob broadcasts Alice's mutation request to make sure both contracts receive Alice's mutation requests. After this phase, both contracts are either tentatively installed with the new lock recipient owner, or they are reverted to its old state. Suppose both contracts are tentatively installed with the new lock and the new recipient owner. Then in the replace or revert phase, if Carol wants to replace Alice, she commits to make those changes permanent. She calls replace function and sends the commit secret, which is a pre-image of the commit lock to commit the replacement. Then in the consistency phase, Bob broadcasts Carol's commitment to keep two contracts consistent. After this phase, both contracts are either permanently installed with the new log, new recipient owner, or reverted to its old state. We see that in replace or revert phase, Carol can abort the transfer. In that case, we want Alice to be able to transfer her role to a new buyer, say Elsa. To do that, we provide protocol Q for Alice to sell her, sell her position to one of multiple candidate buyers. Each candidate is assigned a sequence number indicating the order of them to replace Alice. And there is a counter maintained on both contracts. Those candidates can be served in a first come, first serve fashion, and there's no starvation. That means at last, uh, one honest buyer will get Alice's position. To summarize, we propose protocols that enable an option holder to sell their position to another party. That corresponds to selling an option in reality. We also have protocols to allow an option provider to sell their position. That corresponds to buying an option in reality. Those position sellers can try their best to sell to an honest buyer sequentially. And the selling positions is atomic, non-blocking, and safe. In a word, options should be transferable. This paper will appear in AFT 2022, and, and you can also find our paper on archive. Thank you. Now I can take questions. Uh, it seems here that you're creating uh, an option option for Carol because Carol has the option but not the obligation to buy the option to yes. the contestation. So yeah. what's your comment on that? Uh, how, sorry, can, uh, can you repeat your last question, uh, yeah. last so, sentence? So is it really an option option? So can Carol, does Carol really have the option to buy the option? So this is kind of a derivative on top of an option? Oh, this is a very interesting question. Um, we haven't think about that, but when, since you asked, I think you can build upon it. Since here, the protocol we provide is kind of a framework or the structure of those uh, blocks just to transfer something. Just the, the core idea is to, to replace the hash locks, the hash on those contracts. So I think you can build on um, this one to transfer options of options. Just follow the same, the similar idea. Thank you. Do I answer a question? Thank you. Oh, yeah. So you talk about there are four phases. So I'm just understanding there are four transactions, which could be four times the transaction fees. And then in that case, when you have Bob, so like I'm understanding that Bob had two potential concerns. One is that you need to pay extra transaction fee for it, and then two, if it is offline, can the option still be transferred normally or efficiently? Great question. 
uh, first, uh, um, Bob shouldn't be offline all the time. He should, he should observe what is happening um, on those two contracts as to make quick response to contest if Alice cheats. So the first answer is first, Bob should not be offline. And then for the transaction cost, um, we're thinking of um, maybe you can add some premiums just to cover this cost. So yeah, the transaction cost is an issue, but we can remedy it. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, so if I understood right, this is for swaps between two chains where neither has smart contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if it's possible to simplify in a case where you have smart contracts on one side to, for example, keep like the uh, hash time lock, hash value the same and just swap out the recipient on the smart contract side. Um, sorry, can you repeat your question? I didn't hear clearly. Sorry, it might be too detailed of a question. I can um, come ask afterwards. Uh, okay. I was just wondering, like, uh, it, I was wondering if you thought about it, like options in the context of if you have smart contracts on one side of the swap. Mm -hmm. If I can have smart, if I, um, can we? All good, yeah. <laughs> yeah can we, we can talk it offline, sorry, yeah. Cool, okay. thank you. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, we're getting ready for the third talk of the session and uh, we have with us the speaker, Srav Das from UIUC <coughs> and he'll be talking about practical asynchronous distributed key generation. Hello, yeah. So hi everyone, thanks for coming. So I'm Saurav, this is a joint work with Tom and Jolun who, who are also here and Andrew Miller and Ling from UIUC and Leftris from IST Austria. So I'll talk about distributed key generation in asynchronous network with practical efficiency. So this, this paper appeared at IEEE SNP this year. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll first define what's the, pro what's the problem statement, then I'll give background on various building blocks that we use. Then I'll give a summary of our results. I'll also cover the main ideas and show some evaluation results and finally summarize with some, some of the open problems. Okay, so this asynchronous distributed key generation is a problem pari parameterized by three things, T, N, T, and L. A N is the total number of nodes, T is the number of faulty nodes, and L is some kind of a security parameter, such that so this is a protocol among N nodes where up to one third of the node could be malicious, and they run a protocol such that at the end of the protocol, all the nodes output a common public key, which is h to the g here, h to the g here, and each node outputs a secret key, different secret key. Node one will output z1, node two will output z2, similarly others, such that these zi's lie on a, a threshold secret share of, a, of the original secret z. And each node holds a secret share such that they can use the their shares to do some threshold cryptography. So this is the problem statement. What's our system model? We look at asynchronous networks. That means the message delays between the nodes are arbitrary and we don't also don't have any like a public bulletin board. We have setups, we need public infrastructure and we also need common random string, some uh, informed random string to begin with. There are lots of applications of distributed key generation and also asynchronous distributed key generation. One of the primary one is the threshold signature, and this has a lot of application in increasing the efficiency and feasibility of consensus results. We, we also want to use uh, distributed key generation in threshold wallets. I recently learned people are using threshold encryptions to solve a minor extractable value problem, so distributed key generation also enables threshold encryption so you can use it for, to solve MAVs. And it has also applications in randomness beacon which has lots of other applications like bootstrapping cryptographic protocols and anonymous communication and many others. So, so b brief background. So first, I, I want to describe what threshold secret sharing is. So it's a protocol among N nodes where we have a common secret Z such that any subset of T plus one nodes can recover the secret 
And any subset of T or less node learn nothing about the secret. So this is a very standard primitive. It's called uh, threshold secret sharing. So pictorially, this is what it looks like. We have a uh, secret, and each node l has one share of the secret. This is one construction of threshold secret sharing, which is the Shamir secret sharing. So we embed the secret at the constant term of a polynomial, of a low degree polynomial, and then give each node one evaluation point on the polynomial. So this is a very standard Shamir secret sharing scheme. In, in this paper, we need slightly stronger property, which, which we call verifiable secret sharing, which means that this, this is a protocol. Now, it should work even if either the dealer or a subset of nodes are malicious. So we want, we want to ensure the same property even if a subset of nodes are malicious. We also need something slightly stronger, which we call asynchronous complete secret sharing. Asynchronous here is obvious because we are working in asynchronous systems, and complete means we don't need to know the details for this talk, for, for this talk yeah. So the next reliable we need is called reliable broadcast. And here we have a single dealer that has a message, and we have a set of nodes. The dealer wants to run a protocol RBC RBC on the message so that at the end of the protocol, every, honest node, every node outputs the message. Observe the simple protocols like this, where the dealer simply sends the message don't work, because if the dealer is malicious, it can send different messages to different nodes, and it, can send like a, it, cannot, it might not send any message to any, any subset of nodes. We can formalize the reliable broadcast properties as follows. We need uh, agreement. It says if two honest node outputs, they should output the same message, independent of whether the dealer is malicious or not. We also want validity, which means if the dealer is honest and has an input M, then every honest node should output the same message. This is the validity. And we also have totality that says if one honest node outputs, every honest node should output. Intuitively, you can think of like a normal, your most intuitive notion of broadcast. Whenever you're broadcasting something, you want everybody to hear the same message. So this is what we want to, uh, we will use in our paper. We also need the binary agreement, which is a one-bit consensus protocol. And we, wa we want it in asynchronous setting. So we'll use asynchronous binary agreement. So this is the primitive. We have n nodes. Each node has an input, b1 up to b4. This is a single bit. They run an ABA protocol such that at the end of the protocol, everybody out outputs a bit. But we want some properties, of course. We want agreement. It says every, honest no every pair of honest nodes should output the same bit. Validity means if all honest nodes input a common value B, then they should output the same value. And termination means the agreement protocol should eventually terminate, and every, honest node, sh every node should output something. So this is the asynchronous binary agreement protocol. But there's a caveat here. We know that from FLP85, that deterministic asynchronous consensus is impossible. So we cannot simply bootstrap this primitive. What we need to do this, we need a source of common coin. So this is the requirement to build asynchronous binary agreement. So what are the existing works? There are dis distributed key generation in partial synchrony and asynchronous networks. The partial synchronous was by Kate uh, and Goldberg. And they have a communication cost of kappa n to the 4. Kappa here is the security parameter. You can think of size of a single group element or as an output of a hash function. And there are asynchronous work, very recently done by a bunch of works. They can achieve kappa and cube communication cost, but they have a caveat that the secret key is a group element. In many of the threshold cryptography, we want the secret key to be a field element so that it is compa compatible with, let's say, threshold ECDSA or SNOR or BLS threshold signature. So that's their caveat. So in this paper, we, we want to achieve kappa and cube communication cost. This is our result. We achieve kappa and cube communication cost in an asynchrony, uh, but we, we, we have to pay slightly more in round complexity. And we, we ensure that the secret key is still a field element, so it's compatible with off-the-shelf uh, threshold crypto system. So this is our summary of results. OK. So the paper title is Practical Asynchronous Distributed Key Generation. So whether, yeah. So here is, are the numbers. So this is a research prototype, single-threaded Python implementation. And if we run, so there are two parameters, which is the threshold. Let's just look at the threshold, low threshold, which is threshold 3 plus 1. We can run the protocol with 128 nodes, and it takes about 45 seconds. So I feel if we do have like a more proper practic, uh, parallel implementation, we can further reduce the number. But for high threshold, I'll specify, for the high threshold, the numbers are still 
slightly off, like we, we are not as practical as we wanted, so this is kind of one of the very interesting open problems to reuse the high threshold, um, this, to solve the high threshold distributed key generation problem more practically, because high threshold has a lot more application than, than, than the low threshold ones. Okay, so in this process we also designed an asynchronous complete secret sharing for random secrets, which has kappa and square communication cost and uh, per, per node computation is order n, and we also achieve the homomorphic property that the ACSS transcript, you can homomorphically operate on ACSS transcript to get aggregated values. This is uh, another result in the paper. Okay, let's now talk about how to design distributed key generation. So this is a general framework applicable for both synchrony and asynchrony. So you start with uh, verifiable secret sharing. We call it a way to secret share a, secret, uh, share a secret value. So each node uh, secret share samples a random secret and secret shares this with all other nodes. Then we run a consensus protocol to agree on a subset of nodes that did the verifiable secret sharing correctly. So once the consensus outputs a value, let's say the consensus output one and two, one way is to, we can define the secret key to be sum of the secret, S1 and S2, like the sum of the secret chosen by node one and node two because the consensus output one and two, and the public key is correspondingly the G to the SK. This is, this is a very general framework, works in synchrony. In synchrony, you just need to replace this with a synchronous consensus, or let's, let's say blockchain in asynchrony, we'll see what, what are the difficulties. The difficulty is this, Deterministic consensus is impossible in asynchrony. That's the core problem. And what we know is to do consensus in asynchrony, we need common coin. And the most construction of common coin rely on asynchronous distributed key generation protocol, or some variants of this, the same problem. And here, we are, I briefly showed that asynchronous DKG itself needs a consensus. So we have a circularity issue here. So the main core contribution of the paper is to address the circularity. So our approach, so we work with n, 3T, n equal to 3t plus one, n is the total number of nodes, t is the number of faulty nodes. We have four phases, the sharing, key proposal, agreement, and key derivation phase. I'll mostly focus on the agreement phase because that's the most surprising and technically involved. Okay, the sharing phase, everybody, again, it's the same, everybody samples a random secret and shares it with others using an asynchronous complete secret sharing protocol. Okay, let's say, since we are working in an asynchronous network, different node might see messages in different order, and some messages might get delayed for very long. Let's say these are the ACSS that terminated at each node, so I denote TI to denote the ACSS instances that terminated at node I. So T1 will be one and three, that means node one only sees that ACSS one and ACSS three terminated. Similarly, node two will see two and three, so node might have disagreement on which ACSS terminated. Okay, next, next what, what we do, we have the key proposal phase where each node reliably broadcasts the set of ACSS that terminated at that node. So we call this key proposal phase. So node one will reliably broadcast T1, node two will, node two will broadcast T2, and node three will broadcast T3. So again, due to asynchrony, different, might, different nodes might see the messages in different order, and they might think that different ACSS, different RBC terminated at them. So node one might assume that, might see only T1 and T2 terminated, node two will see T2, T3 terminated, node three might see T2, T3 terminated. So we again still have disagreement here because we, we, we didn't run a consensus here. So the next step is to run consensus. So what we do, we'll run N parallel binary consensus. So we'll start ABA1, ABA2, ABA3, and ABA4. And each node will input one to the ABAs where the RBC reliable broadcast terminated. So node one inputs one to one and two. Node two will input one to ABA two and ABA three. Similarly, node three will do the same. But we, I'm cheating here because I cannot run the asynchronous uh, binary agreement protocol because we don't have common coin yet. So, and recall this is the circularity issue. So we have to address this. And the main idea, one of the main idea of this paper is to use this set itself as a source of common coin. So we reliably broadcast T1, so for ABA1, we'll use T1 as a source of common coin. And for ABA2, we'll use T2, and ABA3, will use T3. So now we have too many DKG sets. We have to now, even that, after that, we have to finalize on one of those. So this is one idea, if you want to take uh, one thing from this paper, is to run different 
uh, use different sources of common coin for each ABA. But there's one more issue is what if there are no TIs for certain I? For example, node four is malicious, so the node four did not reliably broadcast anything, so there is no source of common coin for ABA4. So how, how do we ensure this ABA4 will terminate? So this is another technicality that we need to address, and we'll see this later. Okay, now let's say the ABA is, one of the ABA is terminated and output one, the ABA2 outputs one, each node will then input zero to the remaining ABS, the remaining places where it did not see a reliable broadcast output. So ABA1 will input zero to ABA3 and four. Similarly, others will also do the same. And let's say the, all the first three ABS terminated, the first one output zero and the third one output one. So we still have this issue that we need to address that ABA4 do not have a source of common coin. So what's our idea? So we observe this property which we call good case coin free. So this is a subtlety in the FLP impossibility result. It says that if all honest node input the same value, then an ABA can terminate deterministically. So the FLP impossibility uses the fact that the starting condition is a bivalent, like nodes have different opinions. But if you start with the univalent condition where every node has the same opinion, you can terminate an ABA without a common coin. So, and many ABA construction has the same property, it has this property. So this is our observation which we call good case coin free. And as a result of this property, this fourth ABA will also terminate. So this is kind of the core distributed key generation construction. So the final, so once all the ABAs terminate, we can look at all ABAs that output would one and use that, those key sets and take their union on it or any deterministic function to get the final secret key SK, which will be some of these secrets and the corresponding public key. So we, I just want to mention there are some other subtleties on how to get the public key, the, the, yeah, more like a technical security related issues. The proof is slightly non-trivial at that part, yeah. So implementation details. So we have a prototype implementation on single thread Python implementation. We have, for cryptography operation, we use Rust background, and we support both curve 25519 and DLS 12381, elliptic curves. And we support any reconstruction threshold up to from t plus one to n minus t. Reconstruction threshold is the uh, degree of the polymer which is used to secure share the fi uh, final public key. So we evaluated our protocol using AWS in a geo-distributed setting, and the uh, code base is publicly available. Do not use this code for production, it's just a prototype, yeah. Okay, so what are the numbers? So we run the, so we have low threshold, the uh, solid numbers are for low threshold distributed key generation protocol. For example, with 120 with nodes, I said it takes about 45 seconds, but with high threshold, even with 64 node, we go over 150 seconds. In terms of bandwidth, it's, it's moderate. Uh, it's a, bandwidth uses amount of data sent by a single node in the entire protocol. For 128 nodes with low threshold, it's about 10, uh, 12 megabytes, but the high threshold is still inefficient. So what's the reason of this high threshold inefficiency is the cost of the ACSS phase. So for the low threshold, we use uh, ACSS from our previous paper. For high threshold, we designed a new asynchronous complete secret sharing protocol. And if you look at the ACSS cost, this is the cost of the ACSS phase in the distributed key generation protocol. For the high threshold, it's like about 250 times larger. So that's the reason of uh, in a high, inefficient, high inefficiency of the high threshold distributed key generation protocol. And that this number will get reflected. For example, 134 here will get reflected here at 150. There will be some other added numbers because of the rest of the protocol. Okay, so what's the summary? We have a new asynchronous distributed key generation protocol with the communication cost of kappa and cube. Uh, Okay, this should be computation. The worst case computation for node is order n cube, but in practice it takes only uh, order n square computation. We have log n rounds in, in theory, but in practice it takes about order one rounds. We also have a new homomorphic high threshold asynchronous complete secret sharing scheme. We implement, it, this is the first implementation of asynchronous DKG. So we do not rely on any bulletin board, any blockchain whatsoever. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer protocol. There are lots of open problems. And the most important one, I feel, is to use, improve the high threshold ACS scheme so that we can improve the DKG. But very recently, like in last few weeks, we realized that we can build a distributed key generation protocol 
high threshold distributed key generation protocol only using a low threshold uh, ACSS. We don't need that re relation, but there are lots of subtleties in the proof, so I haven't written the proof yet, so I'll uh, confidently tell about that later. So the reducing, another problem is to reduce the worst case round complexity to order one, and this is, I feel, is a relatively easy problem. You can look at previous works and probably combine some of the results with ours and you can get this result. And reducing the worst case round computation is also feasible, I feel. Another important problem which I don't know how to solve is to give lower bound results, that you want to prove that asynchronous DKG will take order n cube rounds, order n cube communication cost, or yeah, the current kind of lower bounds assumes some kind of structure in the distributed key generation protocol. And one of the practical open problem is to do a better, much robust implementation. I want to thank my authors again, so thank you. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please line up at the microphones. Uh, I have a microphone here, so I can ask a question. Um, you mentioned that uh, in theory, your round complexity is logarithmic, but in practice it's constant. Well, what does that mean? So, so why this log logarithmic shows up is because we have n parallel random variables, each with expected round complexity one. But if you run all of them in, all of them in parallel, you have to look at like an expected maximum. And the maximum can be up to log n. But, and that can happen if the network is kind of asynchronous. But if nodes get messages within like a very short amount of time, everybody can terminate um, all the ABS. So what happens is, so is it's just because uh, the latency of the ABS, we are running n parallel ABS, if the messages del get delivered in like very fast, all the ABS can terminate without a coin because we, we don't have faulty nodes in, the, in our experiments, so we get like a constant rounds. That's kind of the subtlety, yeah. Very nice talk, thanks. Um, so um, is there any caveat to the, in your technique of using the um, RBC output as the seed for the cryptographic common coin? In other words, could I use this technique to improve, say, Honey Badger? Uh, so asynchronous Byzantine for Byzantine agreement. I, I'm not following your question, so. So you are using the output of RBC. Yeah. And uh, is there any assumption on the output of the RBC such that it allows you to use it as the input as the, uh, to, the, to the cryptographic common so, coin? So we want, we, we use the standard reliable broadcast pro properties, and those are, one of the properties is totality. It says if one honest node outputs, the RBC, like everybody will eventually output the message. This is one of the totality property, which is kind of required to run, um, make sure that the ABA terminates, or if the ABA needs a coin, everybody can get the coin. But we, we don't use anything extra. The standard RBC properties like validity, agreement, and totality, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Another question. Uh, you know, that's like a little bit more uh, in the open. Um, this runs for 128 nodes. Um, yeah. How do we make, I mean, it seems like we need to scale this considerably um, to so one know, large is system to, sizes. Um, one is how to do, do we get there? Better implementation, of course. Uh, that's, uh, so if you look at this uh, numbers, the ACSS is, is kind of, for high threshold, for low threshold, the ACSS is faster. It's just uh, like some amount of cryptographic operation. But yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, the low threshold one with this current implementation can possibly scale up to 1,000 nodes with like a good implementation, but high threshold is, uh, I, I don't think even we can go beyond 128, like if we want to get reasonable numbers, yeah. But yeah, better implementation and then possibly improving the primitives. Yeah, but it seems very hard to improve the underlying primitives. Cool, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again and Enjoy the coffee break.